Good afternoon, everybody. Um, delighted to open this hybrid meeting together with Camino, um, who's standing in for Charles Grant, um, both of whom I've known for years. Um, welcome to this face-to-face -face meeting and hybrid meeting. So it's really good to see your, your faces here in, in, re in real life. Um, thank you for, to all of you that have come to join us online as well. Um, and right at the very beginning, thank you, my colleague, Nilsi, who helped organize this event with the Center for European Reform. Um, in 2020, MSD supported the Center for European Reform for a nice little piece of research entitled, Is the US or Europe More Resilient to COVID-19? Uh, this publication. Um, and the authors, who are colleagues of, of Camino, investigated the differences between Europe and the US in terms of socioeconomic models, systems of government, political economy, etc., and how their respective strengths and weaknesses uh, were at play at the outset of the pandemic. Interestingly, the, the analysis weighed heavily in favor of our approach, Europe's approach, to managing the COVID crisis. As a global pharmaceutical company with a legacy in vaccines and pharmaceuticals, uh, we rely on an environment, of course, that fosters innovation and rewards the investments made in the search for new therapeutics and new vaccines. This event today is about European-US collaboration on public health, and our distinguished speakers uh, will share their perspectives on how the pandemic has changed Europe and the global health landscape, and how the European Union and the United States are preparing for the future. Uh, this future will build, of course, on the cooperation agreement signed by both parties in, in June. On my side, at the beginning, I'd just like to stress, stress three points that may be touched on during the discussion. First of all, um, yesterday, the Parliament's Environment Committee voted on the series cross-border health threats regulation, a key piece of, the, of Europe's health union. With this agreement, the European Commission is now able to formally recognize a public health emergency at the European level. This potentially can trigger in stronger intra-European collaboration, coordination, stockpiling, and joint procurement. On joint procurement, my second point, everybody is talking about it. But I think we need to be careful not to see it as a zero-sum game, as a black on white, yes or no um, option, something between, in, in actual fact, it's, it's somewhere between merging sovereignty and national sovereignty. It's not about whether joint procurement is good or bad, it should be about how joint procurement can be made to work more effectively for Europeans. It's no use doing joint procurement if it takes years, and it's no use creating a system that allows 27 parts or even one of the 27 parts always to slow down the whole and undermine the process for everyone. Equitable access for all European citizens means that we have to change and improve how Europe works collectively. Um, and that's been an important part of the backstory, of course, of the serious cross-border health threats regulation. And thirdly, and finally, we need to address our collective global response to pandemics, global supply chains, and managing innovation for pandemic preparedness. As President von der Leyen repeatedly said, no one is safe until everyone is safe. Wherever we are, wherever we're located, we can no longer work in isolation. The nature of globalization is changing with COVID-19, just as it's changing with the war on our border in Ukraine. But globalization, of course, is not going away. And European US cooperation, collaboration, and coordination has become and increasingly will become more important in health policy. So at this point, I'll hand over to Camino to introduce our speakers and to kick off this event on behalf of the Centre for European Reform. Thank you very much, and, and I hope that you all enjoy today's discussion. Thank you, thank you very much, uh, David, and welcome everybody here and online. And thank, thank you all for being here on a very warm um, summer afternoon here in Brussels, and what I assume is also an early uh, summer morning uh, in Washington. So thanks so much for joining us. Um, as David said, my name is Camino Mordela Martinez. I'm the head of the Brussels office at the Center for European Reform, and I'll be chairing these events. As I often do when I have to 
talk about stuff that I'm not very familiar with, I, I would like to kick off with a confession, which is that I'm not a public health expert. Um, like everybody else, I had to learn about the R rates, mRNA vaccines, PCRs and the likes very quickly over the past two and a half years. Um, but what I am, and I think that's important for the discussion, is somebody who is very interested in the European Union and the way the European Union is evolving and will evolve in the future. And that's where I think the concept of a European health union, a European Union with more powers on health that is going to be able to talk and cooperate with other partners like the US or the international organization like WHO on equal footing is very, very important. Of course, the, the European Health Union offers both challenges and opportunities. Um, Commission President, and we, we are gonna be mentioning here, uh, von der Leyen quite often, I think. Um, she says she was proud of the European Union, and I quote, because we have the innovation the scientific capacity and the private sector knowledge. But I'm not sure everybody shares that assessment. Um, some people worry that overregulation might make the European Union slower in responding to threats. And obviously there's, there are wider questions on how is the European Health Union going to um, operate in, in times of um, normal times, let's say, if there's some, something like a normal time these days, so not only in times of crisis, um, how is it going to deal with um, health challenges like uh, antimicrobial resistance or cancer, or how is it going to cooperate with um, the, U the US or other international organizations? Um, another question that is important for me as well is to know whether uh, at some point Brussels will actually acquire the powers to fight or defend the European Union for hybrid attacks, which are also very fashionable these days. Um, and these are obviously bioterrorism and things like that. And that's something that the US already does, as we will um, hear in a minute. Um, I think there are very few people um, who are best placed to answer these and other questions that the panelists that I have um, the pleasure of having uh, with me today. So, with me and online. Um, I'm going to quickly introduce them and then um, I will just give you uh, some housekeeping um, notes and I will kick off the discussion. So um, joining us from Washington uh, DC, Dr. Gary Tisbro is the director of, and I have to read here and I'm really sorry, um, all these acronyms I'm not, I, that I'm not really familiar with. Um, he's the director of BARDA, and BARDA means the Biomedical Advanced Research and Development Authority, like all of you probably know. Um, BARDA is part of the Office of the Assistant Secretary for Preparedness and Response in the US Department of Health and Human Services. Dr. Disbro, you joined BARDA in January 20, uh, 2007, sorry, and you have had a variety of positions uh, within the agency. And um, prior to that, you were a research assistant professor of oncology and pathology at Georgetown Medical Center. So welcome again, and thank you very much for joining us uh, today. Monsieur Pierre Delso, um, you're here representing Team Europe, if I may. Um, lawyer uh, with over 20 years of experience with the EU institutions, uh, mostly in Digi, what now would be Digi Grow, used to be Digi Marks. You can call it Digi Grow. Internal markets, um, which is, as you know, the department of the commission that deals with um, the European Union single markets and um, deputy director general of Digi Sante, the departments of the European commission dealing with public health uh, before becoming uh, the first um, Director General of HERA, and HERA, as you all know, is the Health Emergency and Preparedness, Pre Preparedness and Response Authority of the European Union. Before joining the European Commission, uh, Pierre, you work for a medical, um, sorry, the Chemical Multinational Solvay and the Courts of Justice of the European Union. So thanks so much for joining us uh, today. Um, finally, before we begin, a couple of housekeeping from me. The initial discussion with uh, Dr. Disbro and uh, Monsieur Delso will last around half an hour um, and will be on the record. So we will be recording this. So put your best smiles off and switch off your mics if you are at home and with kids or at the beach or somewhere where, you know, <laughs> we will all like to be. And after the opening remarks are over, um, I will open the floor to participants for a Q&A and this will be off the records uh, to encourage a frank discussion. 
Um, so in that case, you may, if you want, take your smile off. Um, let's get on then um, with our panelists. And I suppose of having opening remarks, I always like to have a bit of a discussion and um, start off with some questions. Uh, the first question is to you, um, Dr. Disbro. Um, you were named director of BARDA at the peak of the COVID-19 pandemic. So that was November, 2020. So I do not suppose you had had much time to follow um, uh, Commission President Ursula von der Leyen's speech, uh, speeches to the European Parliament on the state of the union. Actually, I, I doubt that many people outside of Brussels uh, even do. Um, let me start this discussion with a quote from her speech uh, to the Parliament in September, 2020, where she says, for me, it is crystal clear, we need to build a stronger European health union. And for that, we will build a European BARDA, an agency for biomedical advanced research and development. I guess you might have felt very honored that the Europeans look up to your agency so much, that they actually decided not only to do something similar, but also to name it a European BARDA. I will, it eventually ended up being um, the European Health Emergency Preparedness and Response Authority, HERA. It is clear, and it was clear then, that when it comes to um, public health, to managing public health, Europe has looked up to the United States, so to the way the United States organize its responses to pandemics, but also to other threats like emerging diseases and bioterrorism. Could you explain, for the benefit of those like me who are not that familiar with the work of your agency, what BARDA does, and what lessons do you think we could learn from its uh, decades-long operation? Great. Uh, thanks, Camino. And, and first, let me say I appreciate the opportunity to be here, and at least virtually, and I apologize that I could not be there in person. So the Biomedical Advanced Research and Development Authority, or BARDA, was established uh, by legislation in December of 2006 under the Pandemic and All Hazards Preparedness Act. And BARDA is the advanced research and development arm for the federal government. So we act as a transition partner for programs that have been uh, established at our uh, colleagues from the National Institutes of Health or the Department of Defense as a transition partner for programs that are funded for early research and development, and then take those uh, programs and those products and further develop them under advanced research and development, which is typically beyond uh, phase one clinical trials. We support the advanced development of vaccines, therapeutics, diagnostics, and devices to address chemical, biological, radiological, and nuclear threats, pandemic influenza, and when supplemental funding is provided, emerging infectious diseases such as Zika, multiple Ebola outbreaks we've responded to, COVID-19, and now monkeypox. So BARDA efforts in partnership with our industry partners have supported 63 FDA approvals, licensures, or clearances of products to support public health preparedness and response across our totality of threat space. So some of the lessons learned, and remember, we were in our infancy in 2006, so I appreciate the growing pains that HERA is going through now, is that preparedness is a long-term effort. And it does provide the potential uh, to have products that can be made available immediately through those long-term investments. Public-private partnerships are key to the success, and it has to be a true partnership between the government and the private industry, and it requires sustained funding to maintain preparedness. So sustainment is one of the key messages you'll hear throughout my remarks today. Turning to our COVID response and, and pandemic preparedness, you know, for us in the federal government, rapid supplemental funding is key to initiate efforts as quickly as possible after the declaration of a public health emergency. Our yearly appropriations are not um, earmarked for pandemic preparedness other than pandemic influenza. The government um, can fund and de-risk efforts in partnership with our industry partners to expedite development of available products. And this was seen in the COVID response where the federal government assumed the financial risk associated with scaling up of manufacturing in parallel to supporting the clinical trials so that if an EUA was granted, product would be immediately available. 
And even with these efforts, manufacturing was still the longest lead time in the response. And so moving forward, we feel that efforts to develop um, prototype vaccines, therapeutics with broad activity, and diagnostics against various with pen, uh, viruses with pandemic potential under the American Pandemic Preparedness Plan requires more than just the clinical trials to show safety uh, and potential immunogenicity. We also need to support commercial scale manufacturing and validation of that manufacturing process so that we've worked out all the kinks in manufacturing and that we can manufacture at commercial scale when needed. And then finally, I'd like to state that sustainment is the key. Investments have been made in manufacturing capability and expanding the industrial base for key components for population scale manufacturing of sterile injectables during the COVID response. These include raw materials, fill finish capacity, additional manufacturing capacity, needles and syringes and vials. And we need to sustain these expanded capabilities in between pandemics or we risk losing them. Thank you. Great, thanks so much. This actually sex very well with the, quest with the next question that I had because obviously the COVID-19 pandemic took most of us by surprise. I, I, I would assume that some of, of you working on these things uh, were probably um, alerted before the general public were. Um, but as a result, public policy responses, and that's, I'm talking about Europe, I'm talking about the US, and obviously like um, elsewhere, were mostly reactive. And you were talking uh, just now about um, how manufacturing vaccines and, and testing and, and all these things took a while. Um, it had to be done very rapidly, but it was something that had to be done sort of like not completely like from scratch, but, but actually like in a very, in a very rapid and reactive way. Um, so one lesson I take from what you're saying is um, it is very important to be um, prepared rather than to be reactive. And that's something that I understand governments are, have gotten better at doing, or at least that's my hope. I think one of the examples of that is the current spike of monkeypox uh, cases. Um, so perhaps since you were working um, on, on, on the smallpox vaccine, uh, you, could, you could tell us a little bit um, of what BARDA is doing in this area and why this is important in the future. No, I really appreciate that. Um question, Camino. And, you know, so BARDA has been investing in smallpox preparedness since 2007. Uh, that was when we transitioned the now licensed Genios vaccine from a program that was being developed at the National Institutes of Health. And our efforts over the past uh, decade plus have led to the licensure of the Genios vaccine for the, for the prevention of smallpox and monkeypox and approval of two antivirals uh, for smallpox. And BARDA is currently working with manufacturers to make more product available. And our previous investments meant that the product was available immediately to be deployed uh, at the beginning of the monkeypox outbreak. And so this was one difference um, for what we saw in COVID-19, where obviously we all worked together and were able to develop uh, the vaccines and therapeutics uh, very quickly. But in this case, our previous investments, our preparedness investments, allow these products to be available immediately. However, the USG with few exceptions uh, have been the only purchaser of these products before and since their FDA approval and approval by other regulatory agencies uh, in Europe. And so absent procurements from other international partners, the manufacturers don't see the financial incentive to expand manufacturing above the current demand, which uh, in this case was the US government demand. And so this has now led you know, to claims of insufficient product being available, even though under the current scenario, the companies are not seeing, even today, international demand uh, for these products uh, in a wide um, scope. So we all collectively need to work together better to sustain these companies that are developing these products prior to a crisis occurring so that we do have the access capability, excess capability to rapidly scale up during a crisis. Thanks. That's um, an interesting, an interesting um, um, statement these days uh, in Europe. As you may know, we have established that you follow uh, 
European uh, policy making very closely and you know everything about Ursula von der Leyen's speeches to the European Parliament. So you may also know that there has been a recent push uh, in the European Union for something called strategic autonomy, and that includes health. So we are trying to be much more European um, in our approach to um, supplying critical um, assets, and that includes vaccine. However, to me, it is difficult to think of an area where uh, we could benefit more of um, international cooperation than when it comes to public health challenges like pandemics, but also severe and uh, threats and emerging or long ago gone, ago gone diseases. Um, to just mention that we should be better working together uh, to address those challenges. Um, how do you think? How do you think we should do that? How do you think, uh, for example? Temple Barda and, and Hera in this case could be working together better. Yeah, I appreciate that. And we've had multiple meetings with Pierre and his team, and we're very proud to collaborate um, with the Hera organization. I believe that sharing of strategies uh, is very important and sharing of information to the extent possible is important. I mean, Pierre knows as we work with the private sector companies, some of the information is commercial confidential. Um, but we need to share you know, information to the extent possible. Also aligning on the pathogens with pandemic potential and reducing to the extent possible redundant efforts uh, so that we're not all doing the same thing and, and that we're working together on a unified front. And then again, sustaining the established capabilities as we move forward. It's important um, that we you know, sustain the efforts that we're investing in, especially for COVID-19. I mentioned previously, you know, the investments in the technologies that have been developed, uh, as well as the expanded uh, capabilities for manufacturing and all of the raw materials. We need to work collectively um, between Hera and BARDA and other organizations to sustain those capabilities so that they're available in the future. My concern you know, it is that uh, from a USG standpoint, um, there is always another crisis on the horizon, uh, which will detract um, attention and the funding that is necessary to sustain these activities. But we really need sustained investment to make sure that these are available in the future as we move forward. Thanks. I think I think um, Pierre here and all of us know. Um, of how, how there's always another crisis uh, in the horizon that is going to require uh, money and efforts and how things that used to be very important suddenly become really unimportant um, all of a sudden. So, um, Pierre, you were appointed director of HERA in December 2021, and you have spent much of the pandemic actually dealing with uh, what I assume, what I, what I myself uh, think is, has been a very successful um, handling of the pandemic in the European Union. So it does not sound to me like you had had much rest. Hopefully this year you will get to get to get to have a, a week or two this summer to have a bit of a rest, especially um, taking into account the state of the world that awaits for us when we come back in the autumn and your jobs um, position increasing uh, demands. Um, Hera is an ambitious endeavor, I think. Uh, your service will be at the core of the European Union's reaction to a public health emergency. Um, so it will be able to, for example, trigger a European state of public health emergency, not only you, but together with, with all the services, and coordinate the joint procurement and stockpiling of critical assets like uh, vaccines or medications. Um, so as somebody who has spent much of my early career working on counter-terrorist measures, you cannot imagine how much of a step forward this is um, for me and how impressive it is to me that the European Union has been able to do this and is going to be able um, to, to, to be more reactive in this, kind of, in this kind of situations. But it sounds to me like you have a job that requires a lot of work and is going to require a lot of money. Now, everybody wants money these days, right? So we need money to send weapons to Ukraine to offset the effects of energy um, prices and a cost of living to integrate refugees, obviously to rebuild Ukraine. We don't know what's, what's coming to us in the next uh, month. So um, most people have seem to have forgotten that only some months ago we're at our places without being able to even talk in person uh, because of a horrific pandemic. Um, so when all these things 
um, start making demands on the EU budget? How prepare you think EU capitals and the European institutions are going to be to live up to the ambitions of the European Health Union? Thank you. Thank you very much for the invitation. Good afternoon to everybody. Good morning to, to Gary. First of all, I'm really disappointed what you say about the speeches from uh, the President von der Leyen, that not everybody is reading them. I'm really disappointed. Uh, I'm really, you know, uh, I'm surprised. Anyway, <laughs> and maybe one word to follow up on what uh, Gary said. You know, I'm not ashamed to be called a European Barda because Barda has been a very successful uh, model. And it's, uh, you know, it's not for me, not a problem to, to be called European Barda because it's true that we've taken inspiration from what's happening in the US. So if it's working, why should we not try to get inspiration and do something similar in Europe? Of course, my dream is one day, you know, one US president will say, talking about Barda, that they are the US era. You know, <laughs> maybe one day it will come, but we'll see. Uh, now, more seriously, what you say about the, the fact that, of course, when there is a crisis, people are focused on the crisis. When you have a new crisis, people have their mind focused on the new crisis and tend to forget about the, the previous one. First of all, on COVID, I would like to say something that we are not yet completely out of the woods, unfortunately. As you may see uh, in Europe, we still have a lot of uh, countries where the number of cases are growing. We have now a new variant, which is, you know, appearing uh, in Europe, which is coming from India. Right? It's not necessarily originated from India, but it was, uh, you know, common in India. It's coming in Europe too. And we don't know what will be, uh, you know, the situation after the summer with respect to the COVID. Unfortunately, you know, I would love to be in a situation where COVID is far, you know, behind, you, behind us, but that's not the case, unfortunately. And actually, as you know, we are now uh, preparing the vaccination campaign after the summer. Uh, and even actually, you might have seen that ECDC, so the European CDC, has already announced that, you know, people over 60 should get vaccinated now, not even in a two months time now, that it's time to do it uh, because of the number of cases. So, unfortunately, the COVID is not over. Now, you have to understand me, I'm not saying it's a good thing from ERA point of view, you know, I would prefer people to be safe and not to have the COVID, but it's clear, it's clear that it's still there. Now, what you say about the momentum which is lost is true. But what is important in the case of ERA, like Gary has said, that we have secure financing funding, which is there and will continue to be there. Because we need, when you, when you are talking about preparedness, you need to invest in long-term decisions. You, know, you don't do preparedness by investing something one year and then forgetting the following year. So being uh, resilient, being consistent is key if you really want to be ready for the next health crisis. So we have secure, at, you know, in the EU budget, we have a secure budget which is there, which is available for ERA and for different actions. And actually you have already started to use this budget. You know, we are investing, you know, we are investing in uh, different, in uh, medical countermeasures. We are investing in research. We have already, uh, you know, investing quite a lot in research because really this is important. And also in terms of production facility, we have launched something similar to what exists in the US, which is called AUFAB, which is actually buying some, reserving some production capabilities, uh, which would be useful in case of a crisis. So yes, money is important, but we have money. And that's something which is important. What is, from our point of view, and that's probably a difference with, uh, with, uh, with the US, of course, that we still have 27 member states. So we need to maintain also the momentum and the consensus between the 27 member states if you want to be successful as they are. But I must say that so far, it has been the case. And if I give you a very concrete example, I know what Gary has said about you know, the monkeypox and the vaccine, the vaccine which is available. As ERA, we have been able to secure actually the purchase of those vaccines, of some vaccines, quantity of vaccine, on behalf of the member states. And member states were very pleased by this move because actually some of them were too small actually to get access to the company and just to be able to purchase you know small quantities because you know if you are Malta you don't have so many uh, cases of monkeypox you don't need to have uh, millions of vaccines like uh, the US you know you need a limited number of, of, uh, of vaccines so by acting together as ERA we've been able to secure supplies for all our European countries which without ERA wouldn't have been possible. So to come back to my point, money is there, money will continue to be there. If there is a crisis, we have access to more money if needed, like your Barda, 
So it's something which is out there, but it's also important to keep the political momentum. And I would say so far, it's the case. Again, because we are not Barda, we are not one country, even if you have you know, states, but still it's not the same thing that uh, than in, in the EU. Member states are a little bit more difficult sometimes, but globally, I would say it's working well. Thank you. That's a very optimistic take and a very pessimistic one. I want to go uh, on holidays thinking that COVID is uh, over, but apparently I now have to worry about an Indian variant, uh, which is very scary. Um, yeah, critics of the European Union regularly alludes to the European Union's penchant for regulation and bodies and agencies and things like that as something that can sometimes stop or preclude innovation. However, we saw during the rollout of the vaccine uh, that that was not necessarily true. We have a very successful European um, company at the, at the heart of the efforts of the COVID-19 vaccine. Um, you yourself in your role see a lot of this public-private um, cooperation. And I was wondering whether uh, you can explain a little bit how this works in practice so that we can address this criticism about regulation and how do you think this should work um, moving forwards? It, again, I always want to look at the bright side, you know. Probably you don't know the song, probably you are too young, but, uh, you know, <laughs> that's why you don't need vaccines, but... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> For those who are a little bit older, you, you, it's a Monty Python, uh, Life of Brian. Uh, you know, always look at the bright side uh, of life. What I wanted to say by this is, yes, we are, we are, in Europe, we have always a tendency to consider that everything is much better outside of Europe. This is not true. We have, you know, huge, we have a huge quality in research. We have great companies. We have great people. We have a lot of people who are able to do things which would be extremely useful. That's the first element. Second element, and coming back also to something that Gary said, which I believe is extremely important. We might have the perception that the vaccines have been invented in a few months' times, but it's not true. And actually, it's a result of long-term investment in research on the US side, you know, through BADA and other mechanisms, and also in Europe. So, you know, the vaccines were not just invented suddenly, you know, just a few months because it, no, it's because we have invested, made long-term investment in research that we have been able to develop very so fast those vaccines. But the companies have been able to develop so fast those vaccines. So I believe that's also something which is important. If you really want to prepare, you need to do long-term vision. Otherwise, you will not be prepared once there is a crisis. And I believe that's a very important element. And I agree with Gary on that aspect. Third dimension, which for me is clear, coming back to your perception that we have too many regulations in Europe. Yes, but on the other hand, every time, you know, I've been a regulator, or I've been involved in negotiating legislation, and I remember every time we want to change a, a legislation, there is always someone, even from the industry, saying, yes, but we need this to protect us. We do not accept this. We want that protection. We want this. And then you end up some text, you know, I've negotiated some text where even two hours after having uh, left the room where it was negotiated, I did not myself understand what I've negotiated. So that's sometimes the outcome of the process. But at the end of the day, if you want to look again at the positive aspect, we have a, we have a system which is working globally well, which, you know, as I say, we have innovation in Europe. We should be proud of what we are doing. You know, if you look at vaccines, we have a lot of vaccine producers in Europe. We have a lot, a lot of very good pharmaceutical companies which are established in Europe. So again, we have been able to manage. Now, should we improve things? Yes. And we are in the process, as you know, as the EU, not ERA, but as the EU, we're in the process of trying to improve the regulation on pharma, so-called pharmaceutical legislation. Uh, we are trying to improve things and we are trying to, to do something which will make a difference. Um, it is true that we, we have to stand in the European Union to think that the grass is greener on the other side. I guess uh, that's also very uh, European of us. Um, last but not least, um, in the reports that David very kindly mentioned yesterday, where my colleagues uh, John Springford and Simon Tilford argued that the European Union fared better than the US in the initial parts uh, of the pandemic. Um, I was wondering whether do you think that is a fair assessment? And another question, which is a bit more theoretical, maybe. If that report was written today, would we have the same answer? I will be very blunt with you. I'm sure it's a very good report. But I'm not interested in a race with the US with respect to saving lives. You know, my vision is it's very important that everybody 
in the US, in Europe, and elsewhere also has been protected and has been able to be saved by the, our collective actions. And so, you know, racing between uh, entities, between body of, you know, between the European Union and the US is not for me the objective. The only race I can accept is against the disease. It's just to be ready for the disease, to be there, to be, to, to be effective. And to achieve this, it's clear that we need cooperation upstream. You know, we need cooperation with the US, we need cooperation with WHO, we need cooperation with the rest of the world, but it's fundamental that we work together. And when there is a crisis, also we need a cooperation between us. But of course, it's clear that measures will be decided by the US in the case of the US, by European in the case of, of the EU. But again, I'm sure your report is very good, and I don't want even to comment on the situation now. I would say again, for me, what really matters at the end of the day, is that we have been able, all of us collectively, to develop vaccines which have been effective to protect everybody in the world. To, to, we have been able to take measures which have protected our citizens. You might have seen that you know, a very you know, scientific uh, study has just been published in The Economist, but not only in The Economist, but also in The Economist, where this study demonstrates that probably 20 million of people were safe because of the vaccination and the vaccines. Globally, of course, not only in Europe, not only in the US, globally. But 20 million people, is not a small amount of people. So that's for me the objective. And that's a great achievement of the US, BARDA, US, BARDA, and ERA. But we did not exist, but the European Union at that time. Um, Pierre and, and Dr. Disbro, you both mentioned how important international cooperation is. Um, Neither of you has mentioned China, um, which is um, obviously a crucial player when it comes to cooperating against pandemic, but not only pandemic, but also public health uh, emergencies that can arise uh, because of climate change and, and some other things. Um, so just to, to finalize this, this opening remarks, um, my question is how ready is the world for the next pandemic, especially taking into account that we seem to be walking in the direction of an increasingly bipolar world. So say that we have to address a public health emergency of any sort at the moment where we do not talk to Russia and we do not like to talk to China very much. How we would do that? So I, I can start. Um, you know, so how prepared are we for the next pandemic? I would say, unfortunately, uh, we're not quite there at this point. Um, I think through continued collaboration between partnerships like BARDA and, and HERA and other international organizations, and uh, if we receive the potential funding under the American Pandemic Preparedness Plan and sustained funding uh, to develop prototype vaccines and broadly active antivirals therapies and diagnostics, will be better prepared moving forward. But I do think that Pierre made a, a key point. I didn't see it as a race you know, between US and, and Europe or other countries. I saw it as a race um, against the virus and to make sure that anything that was developed, other countries could leverage that information, those technologies. <clears throat> and then we also you know, made vaccine available for international use. But it, it really takes a collective effort globally to make sure that we have these life-saving medical countermeasures um, during uh, a crisis, but also, as I've mentioned and, and Pierre mentioned as well, in advance of the next crisis, because we have to prepare for the next crisis. I mean, I always make a statement that preparedness is less expensive than response. And by that, I mean, you're funding it over the course of several years, as opposed to the large bolus of funds, and we appreciate the funds that were provided by Congress um, to address you know, the crisis. But if you're always in response, you're going to be chasing the virus and chasing the next crisis versus trying to be prepared and develop strategies that um, can address multiple viruses with pandemic potential as we move forward. I fully agree with Gary on everything he said, but also the last point is extremely important. If you look at the cost of a health crisis, you know, if you look at the cost of the COVID crisis, it's much more than any kind of investment you could do in preparedness. And that should be the message that we should spread everywhere, that we should actually, by investing you know, in health preparedness, you are making an investment and you are making savings for the future. 
And that's something which should be really taken into account by all politicians, all those decision makers everywhere in the world. So to, for me, it's, it's really a key message. And the second key message is cooperation, 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 cooperation. You know, by cooperating, because again, when you look at the COVID crisis, you know, you, you've seen it, it's a global crisis. You know, it started somewhere, probably in China, despite some information I've read in the press, but anyways, it's another story. Uh, it, it started somewhere and it was there everywhere. You know, I remember when we had uh, the first cases of Omicron in, uh, in South Africa. And then as Europe, we took reaction, we stopped, you know, the, the planes, we stopped everything, we say no more links with Africa, let's try to avoid Omicron to come uh, to, to Europe. You know, it came very quickly. And once it was in Europe, it was there everywhere very quickly. And then it went to the US and it was also uh, there extremely quickly. So we cannot avoid such a situation. We live in a world where, you know, next health crisis will be a global one, unfortunately. So that's why we need cooperation and we need to work together again. Everybody having its own responsibility, its own competencies, uh, but still cooperation is a key for the future. Thanks so much. Um, so on that uh, very optimistic outlook, I am still not sure that cooperation will be very easy um, with China and especially uh, Russia moving forward. But uh, that's probably another question that maybe somebody in the audience may, may want to ask. <laughs>